We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, that's Emily, and we are back for race week once again, and we're going to Baku, and I'm so we excited. Are back in Baku, baby. Mm-hmm. I love this race. This, this race I... is really fun. I agree. I like this race. I'm excited to have a street circuit. I feel like we haven't had a street circuit in a while. Maybe I'm it's been a minute. Time who I don't remember anything, so we know this. But it might. It honestly might be since Monaco. Oh God, that's just way hard for me. To think right? right now. Yeah. It's it's um, been a it's while. It's been a minute though, so I'm really really excited. I love street races. This one in particular, it's such a cool track. So yeah, I'm really excited to be back. Yeah. I really like the portion of the track that's like literally just a square. Yeah. It's so good. So good. That's that's one of like the more absurd like track designs, but it also works really well like as like a race related challenge because those 90 degree turns are really difficult. So it's, I just, everything about this whole race weekend is just really fun. No, it is. I just, like, the thing that makes me super nervous, scared, Mm -hmm. is, like, street races are so different, obviously, than intentional tracks, right? So, like, if you have a crash, it's, like, stop everything. Like, we're done. Oh, yeah. And so I just, like, and they make me really nervous, too, because I feel like the crashes are worse on street circuits than in, like, permanent circuits but I don't know maybe that's just me but I always like I love street races because they're so so cool but I also get super like scared and like nervous that something really bad is gonna happen oh yeah no they're they're a lot more high pressure I mean I think you know Imola is is really one of the only like purpose-built tracks that I can think of that is like as narrow you know you know, room for error wise as, as it, these street circuits we have. And Baku is, I think Baku does have like one of the like narrowest portions of a street track in the entire count or of, of a track in the entire calendar street or not street. But yeah, it's there, there's, it's definitely you're, if you screw up, you're in the wall and you know, it's, it's not just a yellow flag and a safety car. It's probably going to be red flagged unless you're like in one of four different spots on track where, you know, you can, you know get the car off the track easily which there really aren't a lot of those spots on these types of tracks and especially not this one no and like knock on wood but I feel like we haven't had too bad of like multi-car crashes this year again no I'm like on cloud 12 and I don't remember correctly but I feel like it's all been (laughs) like k-mags or logan Sargent. so (laughs) I don't know. I, it's just kind of been like a a one man DNF, not like big crashes. Because I feel like we generally, again, gener- generally, but like once or twice a year, we have really big like multi car crashes. I think the biggest one was probably when K Mags took Perez and Hulkenberg out at Monaco. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> yes, and and we'll talk but, about how K Mags' uh, absence will impact this weekend, but we'll talk about that later. Yeah, I think we can get into the news of the week, or should I say the new news of the week? Play on words? Yes. Yep. Um, but to be honest, there's not a ton of news. Like, we had kind mm-hmm. of a two-week break, coming back. I'd say it was super quiet, besides, like, one thing, which is Adrian Newey is moving yep. to Aston Martin. It is official. Now, rumors came out about this. A while ago and the one guy months ago yeah and the one guy from top gear is like you want some tea (laughs) guess who's been house hunting um adrian newey which i think is funny because i was like i did not take that seriously at all i was like oh haha you're so funny oh i fully did when it was it was (laughs) it was jeremy clarkson from top gear and he he said yeah he said um well here's here's the scoop newey is house hunting in the uk not in marinello in in italy where where ferrari is and so and that was and everyone was kind of like haha okay sure but it turned i was like you know he i i would it my thought was that it wouldn't surprise me if he wasn't full of shit and he was right yeah yeah but yeah i'm excited for this to be honest just be like so selfishly like take 
realness out of this. Okay, everybody just like take a step back, get in my mind. Adrian Newey's going to Aston Martin. Lance Stroll on paper will have the best designed car in 2026. And he's still not going to be a good driver. Daddy yeah. Stroll is buying him all of the nice toys and he's still going to break them all. Like, that is why I'm excited to see this. Nothing against Lance Stroll or like his dad. I just, I don't, we've talked about like, I don't know, you know, just someone else taking the seat. He's not doing amazing. Granted, Fernando's not doing great either this season. Well, the car is also bad. Issues. The car is shit, let's be honest. But I don't exactly. know. I think it'll just be interesting to see. But I do hope this brings Aston Martin up into the mix because last year they were in the mix. This year they've taken a deep dive. Obviously, next year, I don't think anything's going to happen. I mean, he's coming in to work on the 2026 car. So right, we have exactly. to, like, temper our expectations with this move. We're not going to see any results for, like, two years. Um, yeah. But I'm still excited to see what the, what it does, how it brings them up into the mix. If this really is going to affect Red Bull, I don't know. I those are my thoughts and feels. I don't know. I I I also I I really like this move. Um, I've I've heard from from what I've read, he's being horrifically underpaid. But if he wants to be underpaid at Aston Martin, then let him be underpaid at Aston Martin. But I I like that he's going to a team that is a project. Right. And, like, he's not just going to another top-tier team. He's not going to Ferrari. And he didn't go to Ferrari for a number of reasons. And he 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 and, and Fred Vassour and what Ferrari wanted and what Adrian Newey wants to do were, like, they couldn't get onto the same page, which is really why Ferrari decided to, like, not go into a bidding war to get him. And I don't think it would have worked out well either way because I just think that the way Newey works wouldn't fit in with Ferrari. But I really like the idea of Newey going to somewhere that's, like, it's a project you know Aston Martin started its life as Force India who became Racing Point who became Aston Martin it's a whole saga so this is this is a team that's been on a journey for many years um and I I like the idea of bringing another team into that you know top tier instead of just it being these same four teams that we've been seeing for so long Right, and I think we all know and could see Aston Martin building to this point, right? The Lance Stroll, or sorry, Lance Stroll, Daddy Lawrence. Stroll, <laughs> Lawrence, that's why I call him Daddy because I mix him up, but Daddy Stroll has been investing in the team and really growing it. They're going to have their own wind tunnel, which is a huge step up for a team to have their own wind tunnel, and I, I see Lawrence and Adrian having a really good partnership because I feel like he'll just go and say, hey, I want to do this, and he'll be like, great. Are we going to do, are we going to get better from it? Awesome. Doesn't matter. I'll build you what you want. Let's do like, he really wants this team to succeed and he'll do anything to get there, including poaching high, you know, high executives like Newey. And he just wants to win. And I Mm -hmm. like, like you were saying the, him going to Ferrari makes zero sense. Him going to Mercedes makes even less sense. Right. Right. Him going to Aston Martin, getting his hands in a project, but it's not so much of a project like Audi. Right. It's it's an established right. mid tier where you can see the progress of his uh, like you can see his magic. Right. And his footprint, his fingerprints, everything in this car to get them to that next level. And I I'm going to be honest, like, I don't think we'll see that benefit in 2026. I think we'll really see it in like 27. I think that's the year where we'll really get like the real Adrian Newey progress car. and car. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's so he's joining the team in March 2025, and he's really coming on. Obviously, that's going to be the beginning of the 2025 season, which obviously this entire podcast, all we do is talk about 2025. We podcast a year behind for the year in front. Exactly. But this, you know, what Nui is going to be doing is really going to be focused on the 2026 car and figuring out how to make a really good car within the new regulation. So it's, he's going to have a lot of guesswork, but so is every other team that's going to be building their 2026 car. So you're probably right. We're not, we might not see, you know, we might see some, you know, improvement up the, up the standings in 2025, but It'll, I, I agree, or 2026, but definitely, you know, once they know what they've got, they're really going to go ham in t- for the 2027 car. And that brings to the question of like, which drivers 
on are going to benefit from this. Are going to benefit this team because one of the things that like Fernando Alonso has said that like he's a little worried that he might not be able to reap the benefits of newly coming and like apparently he was so set on you know helping Aston Martin get newly that he was willing to like take a little bit of a pay cut or donate some of his salary so that they could afford newly. See, I think if he took those steps to help secure newly, like it has to be in writing that they keep him around. Like, I don't see, like, unless Lawrence is that big of a dick to be like, hey, thank you for this. You're out the door. You know what I mean? That doesn't make sense. Unless Fernando's like, hey, I'm just, I wanted this to happen for you because I respect you. I love this team. I need to retire. But I don't see him pulling that card either. Well, and, right. And, and so right now, Fernando Alonso, he's signed, I, I believe, like a two-year extension, which gets him to the 2026 season, which will get right. him to the new regulation. Um, But then, you know, the and then he's going to stay in the Aston Martin family basically forever. He has like one of those Nicky Lauda-esque contracts that Lauda had as a senior advisor at Mercedes for, you know, basically until he died. Um, So Fernand, like, it's, it's really going to be like, can Fernando going into his mid-40s continue to perform and continue to reap the benefits which we don't know about because this is really uncharted territory for older drivers in formula one but you know what if any modern can do formula it, one if anyone it could can do it, it it's fernando him. alonso i think i agree i think i don't know i i could see him <laughs> hello welcome to going off track we only talk about the year 2027 now but i can see him like having 2026 as a trial season and seeing how it goes and like if he's happy with the progress too because that's the thing if the, if they truly aren't progressing then why would he stick around another year oh why so would that. he shop around so he is there at least for one year of the new regulations at least one you know generation of a new car to see like okay is this going somewhere do i want to stick around because if the car is good fernando's a very good driver and i'm sure he can you know score points and get in the standings to where it's lucrative for Aston Martin to keep him around and then he gets into the 2027 super vehicle that Adrian Newey has produced you know what I mean so I'm glad that his extension goes to 2026 and not just next year yeah no I agree and I think that you know it I think it's really up to Fernando and what Fernando feels he can do to benefit this team because I think that Fernando would probably be one of the first drivers to say well I'm not performing well the team's not performing well where where else would I go where I'm going to get an opportunity to be lead driver um and if you know if he doesn't have that he's going to retire and he's going to do so with a happy 200 million year career um that spans (laughs) the entire lifetimes of every single rookie we're going to have on the grid next year pretty much he's driven enough kilometers to go to pluto and back is pluto a planet again in my pluto was never not a planet to me but that's that's an entirely different that's going a little bit further off i'm just trying to be politically correct here i'm Um, i'm team viva la pluto bitches and pluto is still a planet in my opinion but that's you heard i'm stubborn like that breaking news Um, breaking news i think I, I agree with you. Fernando would pull himself out of the car. Like, he's a driver that would do that. 100%. Yeah, exactly. Um, um, and so, then on the other... S- yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I was going to say, so, I don't feel like maybe Lance would pull himself out of the seat. I don't know if his yeah. dad could either. Um, and I don't know if Adrian <laughs> Newey has, like, the authority to take him out of the seat. But I'm really looking forward to seeing what Lance can do in, like, a really good car. Yeah, and I mean, we've, we've talked about Lance a lot, and we've, you know, dragged Lance a lot. And, you know, he's obviously good enough to be in Formula One. If he was on any other team, he would probably not be good enough to stay in Formula One, considering he's never once beat his teammate. But obviously, when Daddy owns the team, you know, Daddy says goes. And, you know, I, Lance has a seat as long as he wants to keep driving. But, you know... Will Lance benefit from an Adrian Newey car? Probably. Will he be world champion in an Adrian Newey car? Probably no. not. Like, no. definitely not. No. And, like, but here's the thing, too. Logan Sargent would benefit from an Adrian Newey car. Would he put it in the wall a bunch? Probably. Oh, like, yeah. Any driver is going to benefit from a better engineered and better designed, be- like, car. So. Right. I don't know. Yeah, I just, I think that. 
I would benefit from it. <laughs> we we have said this before, and we will say it again. If Aston Martin wants to be a constructors champion, you know, caliber team, they're going to need to get a better second driver for that second seat. But that and, and that leads to another question that has been thrown around: Will there ever be an Aston Martin themed Max Verstappen Adrian Newey reunion? Honestly, I'm going to say no. Okay. Because I think that better second driver is going to be Yuki. Well, I mean, there's also the the impending so, Honda, like, but like, I excluding just love the that. irony. I love the irony of like Yuki getting in, finally getting into an Adrian Newey car, and it's he not, not a in a Red Bull. <laughs> Yeah, I so, so there's that Yuki. there's that question too. You know, Max has not ruled it out, and I would honestly, I would be, I would be more supportive of Max leaving Red Bull. Obviously, Max's contract is through 2028, um, but Max might just kick it at you know in 2026 if he's like over it. Um, you know, I would be more supportive as a Max Verstappen fan of him going to Aston Martin than I would have him going to Mercedes. And I know that Toto's like still desperate for him, but I, you know, I would like, I would be, I would live with, you know, Max going to Aston Martin if he's going to leave Red Bull for another team. The, the, here's the thing though. I truly see Max at the end of this contract, just calling it quits. I mean, oh, also that, like I, Honestly, I think that he will only ever be a Red Bull driver, like in, you know, the more reality of realities. But I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't hate to see him at Aston Martin. No, but like, I wouldn't hate to see like him and Lewis as teammates and see what shit happens. You know what I mean? Oh my like, God, they kill each other. <laughs> we could put all of these scenarios together and like, we wouldn't hate it. You know what I mean? But I mean, I, I wouldn't want to have to support a team where I'm supporting both Max and Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. I'd love to not see Checo have a seat, but here we are. So it's anyways. it's those it's those Mexican banking backers. So <laughs> blame them. I think it's telecom actually, not banking. You're pro- I, I, you are right. It, it's telecom. Yeah. It's Speaking of sponsors, big Mexican money and going off track. I have seen because everyone. If you don't know everyone, I lived in Argentina for two and a half years with the work assignment. So I watched F1 with all with a ton of my friends there because F1 is a big thing in Argentina. Franco's now on the grid, which is super exciting. He's an Argentine driver, and everyone's posting everything about him. And, like, Mercado Libre is now officially on the livery of the Williams. If you don't know what Mercado Libre is, it's basically the Amazon of South America. Amazon doesn't operate in Argentina, so they have Mercado Libre. Anyways, uh, but it's so, so funny because it's just, like, on everyone's Instagrams from Argentina. So I literally saw the Williams livery a hundred times today <laughs> on Instagram. I was like, yes. It's amazing. Yeah. Good no, that's for it. them. Yeah. Sp- sponsorship is also, you know, fun. And we had a, we had a uh, little t- chat about sponsorship in the end of, of last, uh, our, our last episode so long ago. Two, I feel like we talk about weeks. it a lot, especially because of we Joe, and I'm, like, convinced that Joe's <laughs> money coming out of china will keep keep a seat but oh it's not happening it's not um, happening we can well, with that i guess we can go right into our steak seat rumors yeah let's let's skip ahead to that but yeah so right now obviously valtteri botas joe guan Yu are the steak the steak drivers sour drivers it looks Soon like to be audi drivers the, Soon, team, the <laughs> team that can't pick a name <laughs> yeah the, the team with fourteen thousand different names um looks like valtteri botas has been like in negotiations um with steak and then when um, Andrea Seidel left and Mattia Bonato took over as the, C- I think he's CEO, whatever. The negotiations basically restarted with Bonato at the head of Audi for a seat next year. But it also looks like we have a new front runner for the seat next year, which would be F2's Gabriel Bordoletto, also an Argentine driver. Wow. Yeah. We have two Argentines on that grid. It is over for you bitches. I don't yeah. know if you saw them celebrate their uh, national or the World Cup win, but hmm, yeah, they will crowd your streets. It'll be exciting, though. Um, yeah, so I, I'm all for having another rookie. 
honestly. Yeah, I mean, I don't hate this. And honestly, like we we've I've I've talked about like all the time when we were talking about like Antonelli and Behrman and you know, these are two F2 drivers that are so highly regarded, but they're nowhere near the top of the standings. Bordoletto is currently P2 in F2 in the championship behind um Red Bull Academy driver Isaac Hadjar, who did an FP1 um earlier this season. But Bordoletto, he won uh the feature races in Austria and then in Monza. He'll be racing this weekend. Also also in Baku with F2, he's actually a member of the McLaren driver development program. And so McLaren actually had to give Audi permission to negotiate with him for a potential contract. But it looks like if things don't work out with Botas, it's going to be Bordoletto in the seat next year. I just want to pause there. It's funny how McLaren had to give permission after they snaked Oscar Piastri from <laughs> Alpine. Like, what yeah. would you really do, Zach? Oh my god, that's wild but I like that we're kind of pulling in new people my big thing is like and my you know what I always think of is Ollie did so good stepping in for Carlos right Mm -hmm. and like he's nowhere near the top of F2 so how good is a someone at the top of F2 gonna translate and this all goes back to our argument of is F2 really truly doing enough to feed into F1 so I'd be, you know, curious to see how he would do compared to Behrman and also Frank. Well, that, it's funny that you should say that because I, I was looking at, at what Behrman has been saying lately because Behrman obviously is back in the car um, this week. And he was saying that, like, nothing prepares you for Formula One, which means that Formula Two doesn't prepare you to, for Formula One. And we've had, like, F2, F3 champions who have, you know, burned out. And obviously we've had, like, the, the 2019 rookie class of Alex Albon, George Russell, and Lando Norris, which is obviously performing very well. But that is a very very like that's a rare you know opportunity it's it's an anomaly to have so many rookies from the same year you know graduating into formula one and being successful all these years later especially when you have like you know logan Sargent performed well in f2 and he burned out you know we have you know mick schumacher did you know decently in f2 and didn't work out um Nick DeVries, you know, all, all of these, these drivers never who have forget. come in, never forget, except when we do. So it's, you know, it also just keeps going back to the fact that Formula Two needs to do better to prepare its drivers for Formula One. And I don't know how you do that. And I don't think anybody knows how you do that. Um, but, you know, like I said, you know, Behrman even doesn't know how to, you know, per, you know, how, how, F2 is going to prepare him for Formula One. You know, obviously he got very lucky that he was super subbing in Saudi Arabia in one of the best cars on the grid in Carlos's car. Um, and that got him into a P7, what put him 12th in the championship for like four months. <laughs> I think he's like 16th at this point. Like he's finally dropping. God bless. Well, maybe he's going to go yeah. back up after this weekend. You never know. We'll see. I mean, and that's that's the question, but obviously he's not driving a Ferrari this weekend. Um, but but no, yeah, we'll see. I, I mean, coming back to the main point, like uh, we all know at this point, if you don't, you're living under a, a rock, Patrick style. But like, I want Joe to be in a seat so bad. I think he's so good for the sport. I really, really enjoy him. And I think it's really been unfortunate for him to come to f1 and not have a good car to actually perform in valtteri botas i know people love him and he's like this character or whatever but like he seems like he doesn't want to be there like he could care less and he kind of drives like that he's not competitive and like he's towards kind of the end of his career i would say he yeah. won a lot and now he's kind of like sunsetting and i don't know it's just like to me, it feels like he's an F1 as an afterthought. Maybe that's completely false and I have the wrong depiction of him. But I just think it's exciting to get rookies in because, like, they finally made it and it's exciting. And they try. I feel like rookies try 120% more than any other driver because, like, they're fighting for that next year. They're fighting for that. Oh, seat. fully. You know what I fully. mean? Fully. It makes yeah, it more exciting. No, absolutely. It it really does. And it, it it's nice to have, you know, new blood and especially going from last year to this year where the grid didn't change. So, you know, I, I like the idea of Bordoletto coming on. Obviously, having an Argentine driver would be very exciting for, you know, all the South American fans. But I, yeah, I, 
I think that it'll it'll remain to to be seen what direction they're going to go in. But I really don't think that you know, like you like yes, you we like Joe. He does a lot of good for the sport, but I just don't see him on the grid next year. Like I really don't think he's a factor in these negotiations with Sauber and Audi. I'm not ready to give up on him, but like. I'm almost there. I'm on like I the mean, last thread of the rope that I'm holding. That's like we have that two seats left, and he's not going to V carb. I know. I know. V carb already has fourteen drivers for one seat. So God, like, I know. yeah, and it's the most we'll, coveted seat, and it's like not even a good car. <laughs> no, it's not. It's just like it's the seat that everybody wants. But we'll we'll see about that. But that we're probably really not going to hear about that until like November, December. Or like the, they might just like keep us on the hook for like all of the off season and like make an announcement right before Christmas or something that's going to like drive us crazy. No, they'll make an announcement like February first, and I'll be like, this is stupid. But yeah. Anyways, before we jump into Baku more, I just want to like circle back <laughs> my professional speak to something we were talking about in the episode from. Monza. Yes. Yes. Monza. Monza. Yes. <laughs> time. Yes. <laughs> so What's we time? were talking about McLaren and like papaya rules and Oscar letting, you know, taking a step back so Lando can get more points in the driver's championships. And and you kind of said like that generally is the team orders is like he has the chance. So we're going to give him all the opportunity. Right. Um, and I said like I think that's dumb <laughs> because if he's driving good just let him drive good well, but he yeah. but he has officially been told there are team orders and he will be helping Lando try to win the driver's championship yeah and and like as somebody who doesn't want to see Lando win the driver's championship in favor of Max, I don't like it, but like, it's the smart thing to do. Like the, and the fact that they had like that it took this long and I think there might've been some behind the scenes stuff, but like the fact that it took this long for them to be like, Oh yeah, I think we do need to put all our eggs in Lando's basket um, in order to have any chance. Yeah. Well, duh. I don't know. I mean, I think maybe it's taken this long to publicly let people know that it's probably been like, Hey, if we're in this situation, like Lando gets ahead. And I think Oscar maybe has not loved that. And it was, but it wasn't truly enforced, i.e. like him passing him in a corner. Right. But now right. it's like, Hey, no, like cut the shit. We're done. We're yeah, and cause like the, the other you thing, know, I think you... it was like a soft, like whisper. And now they're like, you know, this is what we're doing. Because the other yeah. thing is that you don't want is, you don't want what, what almost happened with Ferrari in Monza in 2023, where exactly. Charles and Carlos were going at each other for that last podium spot and they almost took each other out. So yes. that's like, that's what McLaren needs to avoid if they're going to want to be successful in getting Lando the World Drivers Championship. Obviously, I feel like they have constructors in the bag at this point, but with Ferrari also in the mix, which... Um, We'll talk about it a little bit like that, you know, remains to be seen. But it, yeah, I, the, the fact that like it took this long, it's like, okay, okay, McLaren, you've already figured out that you have a contender. Let's actually act like it. Yeah. I don't know. I, I hate this for Oscar, but like, I understand. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I also, I, I still think that Oscar will be a world champion before Lando, but that's, you know, we'll, we'll see about that. And I think that he should be before Lando, you know, not like from a seniority standpoint, but from a, you know, I think he's, I think he's a better driver standpoint. Um, but anyway, I'm excited, again, I'm before we move on, sorry. I yeah. am excited for like 2026 when Oscar is world champion <laughs> yeah, or 2025. Exactly. I, don't, I still am in the like camp of Oscar will be world champion before Lando or maybe Lando I, never is and Oscar is world champion. I, I yeah, I, I'm I'm weird. also right there with you. Yeah. So anyway, let's talk about Azerbaijan. Let's talk about Baku. Um, let's last season, this was when a sprint you, race. Wanna, right. And when you think of Baku 2023, what do you think of? Not September. <laughs> I think of I think of two things. I think it was the beginning of the end for Checo. <laughs> yes. Because because like because he won mm -hmm. both the sprint and the Grand Prix. Right. And then from there, it just really went downhill for him. And it's still going downhill for him. Yep. But the one thing you can't forget, you know what I'm talking about. 
post race yeah. inc- incident. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't even post race. It was end of race right. incident. But yeah, this is like this was one of the funniest, like dumbest moments. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I got my microphone. <laughs> so, if you don't remember what happened last year, I know that Baku was like a year and a half ago. So. Baku is one of those races where you can afford to pit very late. And Esteban Akon did pit on the last lap, but the FIA personnel that were getting ready for like all like the end of race, post race stuff, they were just chilling in the pit lane at the very top of the pit lane as he comes in and had to dive out of the way that he could come in for his last race pit stop without like killing someone. I remember there, one of the like, F1 photographers that I follow who's like um, he was right there and he's like yeah those were FIA personnel who were in the way so the FIA had to like revamp their post-race policies so that this doesn't happen again yeah hold on one second I need to get Benny out of this room because he keeps whining venting oh poor baby I don't want to play with you you go away but Emily go lay down He just stares at me blankly. Um, <laughs> no brain yeah. cells in there. So I love that, like, this huge mess up led to, like, extreme policy changes of, like, what to do post race or even during the race, just in general. But, yeah. God, I'll never forget. Like, and, like, all of the memes on Instagram and everything that came out was just, like, so good. Love it. Yeah, no, that was that was one of like the I think that was one of our top moments of the season from from oh, last yeah, year for sure. And like thinking about it this season, I was like, oh, last year it was a sprint. And I'm like, damn it, it's another sprint weekend. But it's not. We don't have it's sprint not. this weekend. So no, we, I don't. We don't have a sprint until Kota. I feel like it's been a hot <laughs> minute since we've had a sprint, and I've loved it. Loved it. Yeah, we. Well, I was at camp the last time we had a sprint, and. It's, it's, it's been a minute, but yeah, yeah, I was, I was definitely at camp. Well, anyway, one of the biggest, you know, news that we've already talked about related to the race is Ollie Behrman will be driving for Haas, his second team of the season, replacing Kevin Magnussen, who is sitting pretty on a race ban and will be back <laughs> with zero penalty points on his super license when he comes back for Singapore. I, so, again, I, so I saw a post on Instagram and it was like, you guys, he's starting over with zero points in Singapore. And he doesn't have a seat next season. Do you know the chaos Game <laughs> Hex is going to cause in the next, like, however many races we have left in the season? I'm like, oh, shit. Like, is he just going to go balls to the wall, like, with no care in the world? He has literally nothing to lose. Like, yeah. Oh, I can't wait for it. I Human mean, we'll, we'll, we'll see. But, like, you know, I'm really excited for Behrman. Obviously, you know, the last track that Behrman drove for F1 was a, a street track. It was Saudi Arabia for yep. Carlos Sainz, who had an appendix out. But I I really, I am. it'll be really interesting for him because obviously he's never driven this type of track in F1. He has driven right. this track in F2. So he has experience in Baku on this circuit. But this is, this is going to be really different. It's a completely different car, um, you know, completely different environment than Saudi Arabia. Um, and I think that he's really said, like, I just want to have a clean weekend, which is totally fair. Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how he does in a completely different car on a track that he's never raced F- in an F1 car before, let alone this car. So, I don't know. I And it's like, it's things like this. What I we were talking about in the very beginning of the episode of how street races if there is a crash into a barrier, it's like red flagged. And so I hope for Ollie's sake, it's clean for all of the free practices. Cause that's going to be truly his first experience, like on a track in a Haas on a, on this track. So we'll see. Yeah, no, for, for both Ollie and for, for Franco Colapinto, this will also be his, his first, I like his first real shot in, in a formula one car, you know, in Baku. So like right. for, for both of their sakes, it would be, it would be nice to, to keep it clean. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, well, I will not see how FP1 and FP3 go because they're at like two o'clock in the morning for me, but you know, we'll, I will wake up and have seen results. Oh God. I just, again, the time zones. I want to move to Europe strictly for better F1 times. 
that's it yeah for 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 most of them and we we talked about this before we started recording but the the race times this weekend are like particularly bad for where i live in the united states on like the western side um because fp1 is at 2 30 in the morning which is 4 30 for you fp2 is at six o'clock in the morning i'll wake up for that which is eight o'clock for you uh, but then we've got fp3 at 1 30 in the morning so if i just stay up all night i can catch fp3 i will not all of my is at 5 a.m. 7 for you. I will grumpily wake up at 4.55. And then the race for me is at 4 o'clock in the morning. So either I'm not going to sleep at all or I am going to go to sleep and set a 3.30 alarm so that I can wake up in time for the grid walk or whatever we have if, if Martin's not there. But, ooh, wait. I don't think Crofty's going to be here this race. Oh, is this one that he's taking I off? think this is one of the races that, that Crofty will not be there for. Well, while you're looking that up, I just want to point out, this is what I love about F1. They're like, hey, we're trying to grow our American fan base, but we are not, not. buckling to your time zone. We do not <laughs> yeah. consider you. We only plan for Europe. Get in line. <laughs> Yeah, you exactly. Want to, well, you want to race in Vegas? Great, it'll be at midnight. Yeah, midnight. <laughs> well, and, and that's exactly it. why they're they're adjusting it. Yeah, so so we will have so so Crofty. This is one of the three races this season that Crofty will not be at. Harry Benjamin will be back in the paddock um, um, once again. Um, he he did a, a great race. The, the la- I don't remember what that race was, but it'll be great. Oh, not only is is Crofty not going to be there, Crofty is going to be on his honeymoon in France. Um, which is the primary reason why he is not going to be available to do commentary for this weekend. Good for Crofty. Yes. Good for him. I mean, this this is the first season in his career, in his, his F1 broadcast career that he's missed a race, let alone three, but this is a good reason. Oh, yeah. Definitely. The man needs a break. Yeah, so. exactly. Anyway, to go back into to the race, we do have a few notes on upgrades that are coming we in this weekend. Do. Um super which exciting. I think one of the really interesting ones is Mercedes. They brought a floor package upgrade to Spa that has not worked out the way that they wanted, so they are bringing back the pre-Spa floor spec, um which they are hoping will help them improve to, you know, be more competitive with the, the three top teams um and, you know, not have another George Russell DQ. Lol. I mean, yeah. Mercedes has been semi-competitive. Like they've had wins this year. That, that they've been last more. Year. <laughs> I feel like they've been very streaky, and by streaky, like streaky in the sense of like, because obviously Mercedes is that team that gets like sneaky points every race. They 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 come away with a ton of points, but they've been streaky and like they'll have like a really good race, but they won't follow it up with another really good race. They'll follow it up with like where they had been in like the mid, you know, the middle of the top scoring positions instead right. of having like a race where they have a podium and then another race where they have a podium or maybe a double podium. We haven't really seen a lot of back-to-back stuff from them lately. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, Williams and Ferrari are also expecting to bring new front wings. So yes. that's exciting as well. <laughs> Who knows what it'll mean for Ferrari. But I'm happy to see that Williams is still, you know, working and upgrading their car for the current season. I thought maybe they would kind of just abandon ship and focus on next season. But it's good to see that they're still, you know, in it to win it. Not win it, but like... <laughs> keep going. In it, keep in it to keep going. Um, yeah. And then I think... Red Bull is bringing a new floor. They're bringing they're bringing parts of I believe they're bringing parts of their new floor that they're planning for Kota and for for okay. the United States Grand Prix, which is after uh, it's way after Singapore. But I think they're fast tracking elements of it because they think that like if they fix the floor, they'll fix the balance issues that Max has been struggling with, and that'll gotcha. help Max be be more competitive. But this will be really interesting, especially like the new front wings because. Obviously, and I talked about the the track design at the top of the episode, but like the these ninety degree turns are very difficult um, yeah. in these types of cars. So the front wings that are being brought and like all of the setups are really going to be about like how you corner, how you turn, um, and and how you you know stop yourself from going headfirst into a wall. Yeah. Should be interesting. I always love to see upgrades. I feel like it's hard though on street tracks because we don't get like a full like 
I don't know the word for it, but like we don't get to fully see how it works on a straight track. You know yeah, what I yeah. mean? Yeah, you, you you don't get to see all of the benefits of Thank an you. upgrade. I couldn't, couldn't yeah. Think of the word. I got you. I got you. Yeah, you you don't see all of the benefits of it until you're on like a purpose built track and you can really see it because there's so many other factors in a street race, especially right. like a street race as narrow as uh, Monaco and as Baku. So, and obviously Monaco is also just another issue when it comes to, to, you know, tracks in, in general. Um, but it, it, it really is, you know, you really don't know, but we'll see, you know, how these upgrades will benefit these teams. And I'm not sure what other upgrades we've got. I think, I don't know if McLaren's bringing anything. They've already had like three big upgrade packages so far this season, but it'll be very interesting because all of these specs are going to be for like the corners and the turns and, you know, maximizing that as opposed to just like straight up speed because you don't really need that as much on this type of track. Right, right. Especially since they're already, they're, ex they're, they're, expanding the length of the first DRS zone, like by a hundred meters. Yeah. Um, I saw so that. yeah. So like that, that takes care of like any, you know, a lot of like the straight line speed questions that you really don't need as much compared to you know, making sure you can turn the car around those 90 degree corners. Turning is good. Turning is important. <laughs> um, so something else I'm really looking forward to this weekend, besides seeing the upgrades and getting back to the streets is a possible new leader in the driver's championships. Ooh. Yes. Yeah. So, so it's going to be really interesting. Yeah. No, but like I I did I was I was doing some some math which is not my forte. Um but there's only 39 points between Red Bull and P1 and Ferrari and P3. So any one of the three teams, Red Bull, McLaren, Ferrari could take the lead in the drivers championship this season depending on how how things go. Obviously Ferrari is on a little bit of an upswing these past two races, so they could, you know, leapfrog two spots if, you know, if they won if they won two and get fastest lap, they can they can potentially, you know, get a pretty good haul, especially if, you know, other bad things happen to the other teams where they don't end up scoring. It's not going to be very likely, but the more likely is going to be McLaren flip-flopping up with Red Bull unless something really drastic happens and, you know, Ferrari takes over, but we don't know. But we could see some changes and it's a lot more likely than it has been in a lot of weeks, months, two years. Yeah, and like, not that I wish ill upon anybody, except for Checo. Um, <laughs> but I just, I really personally want to see what would happen if McLaren leapfrogs Red Bull and Lando's gaining speed on Max. Like, is Max just going to throw a pity party or is he going to like... I don't think so. Step up and actually start driving. Like, I know he's having issues with the car, but, you know, he's Max Verstappen and he's amazing well so. i think it, it plays into the like he, the fact that he's amazing is is the fact that he's still on or near the podium with these issues compared to checo who can barely finish in the top 10 Catherine and now works for the pr team of the red bull <laughs> i'm a red bull team. fan so yes spoken like a true no which is fair i mean i just think it's it's he seems a little pouty lately when he's like, well, how can I drive a car like this? Like, of course I'm not doing good. Like, I don't know. I honestly haven't, and this is not me playing, you know, Red Bull PR, but I really haven't seen a lot of like, you know, the, the, him being pouty. It's like, I don't know how things are going to go considering how things are with the car. Um, he, so we're just perceiving his interviews differently. I, I feel like he has been a lot giving less him the Red tantrum Bull grace. <laughs> well, no, but I just think that he's not being very tantrum-y lately. Like, he's obviously unhappy with the situation with the car, but I don't think he's throwing a tantrum about it. He's just kind of like, I don't know, we're figuring stuff out. I appreciate your take. <laughs> it's the correct right. take, so there. <laughs> There it was. I was waiting for it. <laughs> okay, with that, let's get into our Baku predictions. So for those of you new to the podcast, if you don't know, Catherine and I make predictions for Polo Podium and P10, and we give ourselves points. Last season, we got pretty, you know, liberal and creative with it, throwing Alex Albon on the podium. This year, we decided to take you a little bit more You had the right serious. to do that, though. <laughs> I did. I had the right frame of mind. I still bring it up because it's just like... The best it's example. funny, but he started that race like P4. <laughs> I know. And I was like, I got it. And then he was like P8 by the end of the race. Whoop. Yeah. Um, but we give ourselves points now to take it a little bit more seriously. So, yeah. So, for Pole for Baku, Catherine, who do you got? 
That's a great question. Let me pick. Let me pull up my predictions. I, know. I let picked, me pull my notes up. Yeah, I uh, I picked Oscar for Paul. Love, 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 love. I am also on that McLaren train, um, and I have Lando. Okay, I think so that's the opposite of last week. Yes, last week, because I picked. I picked Oscar. I'm like, I know it. I know Oscar's going to come in here. And and then Lando did it. Lando. I know. Yeah. Okay. So with that, who is your podium? Okay. So I, I feel like I'm like mixing it up a little bit or a lot of it compared to what I, what I usually do, but I am going a Charles Leclerc P1 and Oscar Piastri P2 and Max Verstappen P3. So Lando's going to bin it. Yeah. Lando might bin this one. Oh wait, no. Cause you have, you have Oscar. Yes. As your poll. Yes. I, ha- I have looking Oscar at mine. Poll. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, he might if he's not on the podium. So that might be considering, you know, considered binning, binning it. Huh. Interesting. We'll see. Yep. yep. So I feel like this is an oldie but a goodie. Um, I went Lando Oscar, even though I think Oscar is going to have a better drive. I think he, team orders, he's just going to have to like be there defending. Um, yeah. And then I have Carlos in P3. I think it's, right. I think it's time for him to be back on the podium. So I mean, I don't disagree. Like, my, my picking of Charles is fully reluctant. But, yeah. Honestly, I just, like, I can't put it in my heart to put can. him on the podium. So, yeah. Anyways, okay. And then my favorite that we pick is P10. We pick P10 because it's the last position where you get points in the race. You get one point for P10, but we give ourselves three because it's really, really hard to pick. So, yeah. Catherine... Who is your P10 for this week? I'm going super optimistic. And I'm and and I am going for probably like a little bit out of left field, but I think this this will really give us an opportunity to see what we're getting next year. And I'm picking Ollie Behrman in P10. Love, love, love. I'm also picking a new to the grid human. I am picking Franco. You're picking Colapinto. Okay. Colapinto. Yes. I think I really liked what I saw out of him last week, and I think he's just going to keep improving. He literally has nothing to lose, so I think he's oh, going to yeah. go for it. Yeah, and I think that that Baku could be a, a good track for, for Williams. I mean, um, I looked at last year's results, and Haas was, like, just out of the points last, um, in, in last season's races and in both the sprint and the, um, the Grand Prix. Um, so I, I think it could be reasonable of either of them, and in which probably yeah. means it's going to be neither of them, <laughs> but we'll see. Yeah, so that goes kind of into my biggest surprise of the weekend. I have a double points weekend for Williams. Ooh, bold. I like it. I know. Um, my 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 biggest surprise is a little bit more tame, but it's Red Bull has a good weekend. <laughs> okay, that's too general. I need specifics. I know. You know, I, the top five finish for both. Let's just go with that. Okay, that's great. And now we can go into my dumb, which is just which is Checo, gonna be period. Check out. <laughs> He's gonna come in like, yeah, of course man, it is. I won these races last year. I got this, and then I don't. No. Um, no. I'm gonna say, yeah. and it, it starts with qualifying. I don't think he's gonna qualify well. And no. I think he's just going to have a terrible race. I've lost all faith. If I even had faith in Checo, it's what completely faith? gone. <laughs> yeah. No, you lost faith in, faith in him when he had the double DNF in Suzuka um, two years ago. No, I th- honestly, I think I lost faith before that. And then that was just like the nail in the coffin. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Again, another episode, we're sliding in the double DNF. I Bingo. Um, which I, it was not two years ago because we weren't podcasting two years ago, but it was last, it was last year. year. Yes. It's okay. It was last year, but it, it messed with, it, it messes with me because last year Suzuka was like this time of year and this year, and like we've already had Suzuka. The, this new really ca- calendar the schedule throws is us. throwing me off. Like, yeah, very, very baffled. But anyway, to go into my dumb, I think that Mercedes reverting to the old floor spec is going to set them back. So my dumb of the weekend is that Mercedes is going to struggle because they're going to the old floor. Fair. Completely yep. fair. Yeah. All right. To wrap up final thoughts. I'm excited for this weekend. I'm excited to see what Ollie does. I'm excited to see Franco on his first F1 street race. I'm like his number one fan now. This, this is making switching to Williams next year. So, so much, much easier. easier. <laughs> I mean, all I can hope for is that it's a James Wells weekend. I know it's not going it to be a James be. Wells weekend. It's going to be like the carb weekend, and it's just going to be like awesome. Can't wait. Um, yeah, I wouldn't. As honestly, long as it's not mind. a Bradley weekend, though. <laughs> we just had a Bradley weekend, though. I wouldn't Thank mind Zach God. Brown weekend. Honestly, I feel like he does give us more. Like he does talk a lot. He can't technically, and like 
engineeringly wise talk to us like JV does, but I I don't hate Zach. And now that you know McLaren's doing good, let me re- let me hold on. Let me clarify because I think it's really important. I don't hate Zach Brown weekends. I would yes. like to make that justification. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's not my favorite person. Make it clear. Yeah. <laughs> he is the villain of my F1 story. Yes. But I don't mind when he's on the broadcast on weekends. Okay, yeah. clarification over. Um, yes. Yeah, I think it's going to be a really good weekend. Yeah, I, like like I've said, love this race. Love Baku. Don't love the fact that I'm going to have to wake up at 3.30 in the morning to, to watch this I know. race. It's but so brutal. It's like this, this, this is brutal, and Singapore is going to be brutal because um, Singapore is like a five o'clock race for me. So you know, one one more hour. But I, I just, I, I really like this track. I'm really curious to see, you know, how both of these rookies do, um, and you know how how you know we're we're getting into like the last third of the season. So it's it's getting really exciting. Yeah, it is. I'm pumped. Yeah. Well, with that, let's get into your F1 fun fact, Catherine. What is your F1 fun fact for us this week? So F1 fun fact kind of goes a little bit back to two weeks ago when we were in Monza. You know, time is weird like that. But on the 13th, so you're probably going to be listening to this on the 13th, um, 15 years ago, Bron GP, when we did a whole episode on our reactions to the Hulu Braun documentary, um, which if you're watching on YouTube, it is linked above. Um, but Braun won its last race as a constructor. Um, and it was also the last win for one of Braun's drivers, Rubens Barrichello. Um, and also going back to the journey that Aston Martin is and has been on, it was the first time that a Force India car has finished a fastest lap. Huh. And look at where they are now, hiring Adrian Newey away from Red Bull. Look at where they are now. Braun is now Mercedes, and Force India is now Aston, Aston Martin. Martin. Yeah. So I love seeing time's those funny pictures like of, like, where the teams were and, like, what they are now. And then it's just, like, Ferrari. <laughs> yeah. We've always been here. Always been here. Always will always be will here. Be. <laughs> and Forever yeah. Ferrari. <laughs> it's, it's funny, like, looking back and, like, how sometimes it, sometimes it gets a little complicated. And I haven't really looked, like, beyond, you know, force india and what was before then but you have some teams that like come on come off even sauber and the way like the the long history of sauber um it's like formula one genealogy for for constructors and for teams is fascinating it really is and like why they left and how it changed hands yeah so exciting well even like Maybe, mercedes's oh, journey is Catherine, we, should we can have we can do a that genealogy episode yeah that could be what, one of every team Ferraris can be five seconds. Ferrari. <laughs> yeah. That we we can we will do I mean, we've been like threatening to do F one oh ones for basically since I like and since my life before the summer break. Up. And then I had I to come home from camp and you were moving countries and then we just got busy. But we will do some um F one oh ones uh between Singapore and Kota because there will be like, like four idea, weeks. Though. It's a brand it's like a second summer break uh between between which it's I don't insane. love but it'll give us some some time to do some F one oh ones. We will do I, I like the idea of doing F one genealogy. So let's do more it. More to come. More to come on genealogy. We'll just, you know, dive on in for you guys. But up next, officially, not teasing enough, 101, we will have the Baku recap episode coming out on Monday after race weekend, which, oh my gosh, it's not even like a race weekend. It's just like awful mornings for us, but it's okay. It's, it's like will... a race late night. Alas, we will... I'm going straight to back, right back okay. to bed after after the race is over. I don't like, know how you do that? I just can't do that. But that's that's my Sundays now. <laughs> Neither here nor there. <laughs> yeah. Sundays. Wake up super early. Go back to bed super early because it's still super early. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Love. Uh, all right. Well, thanks for. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> that has been our Baku <laughs> predictions episode. Thanks for going off track with us, guys. <laughs>